All right, I believe we're going. I have watched this video about four times now. Uh, and so before we get started, so we're looking at unit three. It's a big old unit, 1754 to 1800. Uh, kind of reminds me of that World War II video. Just so much stuff going on from, well, Spanish-American War, World War II. We got French and Indian War. We got, like, the taxes and everything. Then the Revolutionary War. Then you got the Oracles, Confederation, Constitution, and Washington and Adams. So there's a lot of big stuff, uh, seems to me, in this unit. So, you know, you take a few minutes to put down all the stuff you know on the left side over here. Pause it for a second put all that stuff. All right. Uh, and then once you get ready to start it back up, I'm starting over here with my stuff. So we're starting with the, the 1754, 1754, 1763 is French and Indian War. All right. So we're starting right there. Uh, so I'll just put French and Indian War. All right. We know what they're fighting for, the Ohio Valley. Uh, so it's like three causes. The French are up there in Canada, right? Remember... Uh, uh, Champlain, he's the father of New France. Quebec was founded in 1608, right after Jamestown founded in 1607. Remember the, you know, they called the French and Indian War because the, the Indians, other than our old buddies, the Iroquois, tend to be on the side of the, uh, the French. You know, the French didn't have numbers. They're up there in the cold. There wasn't that many French people that came. Um... What was the deal? The French, uh, the French Huguenots. Remember, they didn't come. They had religious freedom. The French peasants had land. So I mean, there weren't as many French peoples come. There wasn't much in the way of push factors. Less in the way of push pull factors because it's cold. Uh, so Champlain doesn't have a choice but to be nice to most of the, you know, the Indian tribes, the Algonquin Indians that he uh, encounters. All right. So the French were land rich and people poor. New France, going all the way down into the Ohio Valley, all the way down to like New Orleans uh, and Louisiana, named after Louis, you know, the 14th. Um, and uh, the 13 colonies, you know, they're people rich and land poor, so they're wanting to push out west and that Ohio Valley is good land. You know, that's where Pittsburgh is, going to be named after William Pitt. Uh, three, we got, hey, we got two song selections from this unit. You will remember that, um, uh, the Ohio Valley is where three rivers come together. Pittsburgh's stadium used to be called Three River Stadium. So it was the Ohio River, the Allegheny River, and wait for it. Starts with M. Anybody got it? Monongahela. Oh, so we fast forward back up to the Gilded Age and, uh, we got Youngstown from the Monongahela Valley to the Masabi Iron Range to the coal mines of the Appalachia. The, the story is always the same. And remember, that was the kind. Of, that part of it was kind of a story of a uh, vertical consolidation. That Carnegie cut out the middleman, and he, every step of the steel making process, he was controlling it. But we're back in the French and Indian War, so it's just good farmland. The Ohio Valley is. Uh, and so that's where the, uh, that's where both sides want. So Washington heads out there, uh, he gets in a fight. He's a surveyor, remember? He's a young man, Virginia planner, uh, and he's surveying the land and he kind of bumps into, you know, some French and they have a fight at, uh, Fort Duquesne. Uh, remember that little film, The Half King, like, you know, when the French surrendered, the, this Indian guy, like, chops the guy in the head. So then, you know, Washington knows there's going to be trouble. So they, by necessity, they've got to build a fort. So he loses a fort necessity. However, the bullets had a charming sound. So there's the beginning of Washington. And Washington's fighting in it. Uh, Pitt's the hero. Pittsburgh's going to be named after William Pitt. Uh, Pitt's going to send a whole lot of troops to fight, you know, in uh, North America. Remember, it was the Seven Years' War in Europe. And like Frederick the Great was like the, what, the Prussian hero uh, over there. But the uh, French and Indian War lasted nine years, 1754, 1763. So when Pitt sends a lot of troops over there, that kind of, over to North America, that kind of change, turns things. Uh, when the British capture Quebec, you capture the capital. You pretty much win the war. Um, so the Treaty of Paris is ending it. Treaty of Paris, the big losers, France, they pretty much got to get out. Uh, what, they're holding on to Haiti. They're ho holding on to a couple of islands in the Caribbean, but not much. Uh, and the British control Canada, the eastern part of North America. The Spanish are still out there in the west. Um, and, but it causes a big debt. All right, so boom, there you go. You're right into all the laws that are going to be passed to try to pay off this debt. 
All right, so let's go with it. First off, we're going with the navigation axe, which was back, passed way back in period, I don't know, like 1, 16, 51, saying uh, the colonists are only supposed to be trading with the British. And remember, John Hancock was the smuggler, and so, you know, the British trap uh, had practiced salutary neglect because everybody was doing okay, but now they're cracking down. Um, and you got the proclamation of 1763. Can't move west of the Appalachians. There's Indians out there. Uh, they're going to be trouble, and the British don't want to pay for protection. But, you know, our early Americans include a lot of uh, pioneer slash e illegal immigrants. Uh, so remember uh, Daniel Boone. All right, song selection number two. Daniel Boone was a man. It's a big, I can't remember if it's big or real, big man. And he fought for America to make all Americans free from the coonskin cap on the top of his head to the heel of his right hind shoe. Here's the here's the here's the line now. Anybody remember it? Say it like over the thingy to me, and like I'll telepathically throw you a Jolly Rancher. He's a ripping this, roaring this, fighting this man. The frontier ever knew. That's a dang good line in. All right, so he goes out there, uh, and the you know the British don't they don't do much about it. Then they pass that Sugar Act where they're kind of cracking down on the smuggling. Uh, they're lowering, but they're enforcing like the tax on molasses. So it's kind of the anti-John Hancock act. act. Uh, and then you got um, Stamp Act. So Stamp Act's a big one. So let's back up just for a second. Well, my goodness, uh, I forgot to put any laws. All right, so we got what? Navigation Acts? I didn't type anything. I was busy singing about ripping this, roaring this, fighting this man. Navigation Acts. Uh, Proclamation 1763. All right, Sugar Act. Uh, next one, Stamp Act. All right, so these colonists, you know, they were kind of Republican. You know, they thought you had to be good if you were going to have freedom. And, you know, there were Whigs in England, didn't really like the king. That's where the Whig Party during the Jackson years got its name. All right, uh, and so the Sons of Liberty, they, you know, they don't like the Stamp Act. It's a tax on everything because so much stuff's made out of paper. You know, playing cards, newspapers... Birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, all that stuff, you know. So many different things. That it's taxation without representation. All right. I don't know. So I'll put without representation. James Otis is the guy that did it. Remember, he's the guy that ended up getting a bar fight and the pan was tied to his head and he went nuts. So Sam Adams kind of becomes the leader of the Sons of Liberty. And what? They're going to do a boycott. Uh, and they're not going to buy clothes so the Daughters of Liberty are making the clothes. All right, and then you got the repeal. All right, but you get that pattern going. Remember, you get the back down, then the crack down. All right, so they back down and they repeal the Stamp Act, but then they're going to pass the Declaratory Act saying we can too do this stuff. All right, so the next law they pass, Townsend Act. It's not that, the, I, hey, I didn't type Declaratory Act. On my first run through where I botched the tape, I ran out of room, so I'm going to say a few of these laws without actually typing them. Townsend, that's fun, right? Glass, lead, paper, paint, tea. All right. Uh, and so the Sun Delivery going to get mad about that. They're going to be throwing snowballs, cussing, fussing. Boston Massacre. All right. Uh, so, you know, the opposition, uh, the colonists rise up. The British back down on the tax on glass, lead, paper, and paint. They just keep the tax on T, which is not the T Act, but then they pass the T Act. That's the crackdown. You got the back down, then the crackdown. All right, uh, and so the T Act uh, is the monopoly for the British East India Company. Well, that's going to lead to the Boston Tea Party. All right, they dumped a bunch of tea overboard. What was it? I can't remember how many million dollars. T, let's say it's $10 million. All right, worth a T. All right, uh, and so the the crackdown uh, is going to be, hey, you got to pay us back. Uh, and until you pay us back, we're closing the ports and the legislature, especially the Port of Boston. So let's either call the coercive or the intolerable acts. So then the colonists get all fired up. They have a Continental Congress, the first Continental Congress. They, you know, make a list of demands, and they're storing up guns. So here come the British. The British are coming, election in Concord. Coming to Lexington for Adams and Hancock. They're coming to Concord for the guns. Uh, shot her around the world at Lexington. So you got your war. All right. Um, what? 
the advantages. I mean, the British got more of everything. They're kind of like the Union Army in the Civil War. All right, they got a standing army, and you know they're the biggest, baddest uh, empire in the world. They're kind of like the United States in the Vietnam War. All right, uh, the the colonists got home field advantage. They know the terrain. They believe in what they're doing. They got Washington. All right, uh, so hey, let's throw some Washington in there. Washington times two, at least General Washington. So he's crossing Delaware on Christmas night. Uh, he's keeping the army together at Valley Forge that awful winter. When, you know, they don't have shoes because the government doesn't have any power. Uh, battles. Battle of Bunker Hill. Don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Is a Pyrrhic victory for the British, the colonists. Uh, let's see. By this point, Bunker Hill. That's 17. So this is the United States of America. All right. Uh, at Bunker Hill. And my goodness, you got the Declaration of Independence before we go any farther. Committee of Five. Jefferson, the big three, Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, the other two, Sherman, what's that guy's name? Oh, my goodness. What's the other guy's name? Sherman, and the first time around, I knew his name. I can't remember. It'll come to me. All right, uh, but Jefferson's doing the writing. All right, and it's like the social contract. You remember, it's kind of like the divorce, and he's saying, hey, I got to explain what we're doing, why we're doing this. This is a big deal. Hey, government's supposed to do certain stuff. It's supposed to protect rights. If it does that, people obey it. But if it doesn't, you get rid of it. You got the right to alter or abolish it. Well, King George hadn't. Look at all these awful laws, so we got to get rid of them. It's that social contract and the right to revolt. Livingston, Livingston and Sherman. I knew I knew that guy's name. All right. Um, let's see. So the Declaration. All right. Turning Point Battle, Saratoga. Remember Bill Benedict Arnold's one of the heroes of this thing, even though he ended up being like the traitor? Um, Franklin was over there getting French help. Uh, and he had the coonskin cap, and he flirted with the ladies, uh, dresses up like a real American hero, you know. Um, and so between the battle and Franklin, you know, the, the French help, uh, and, hey, I think we can kind of fast forward to the Battle of Yorktown. Let's see. You got, like, Patriots and Tories. Uh, that's just a big old war. It's like the Civil War and World War II. Uh, so, I mean, the colonists, the, the Americans, the colonists were, in, were divided. There are a lot of loyalists down here. There are a lot of loyalists in the big cities. Um, outside Boston, uh, the Patriots, closer you're getting into New England, closer you're getting to Boston, the more patriotic the place becomes. Hey, it's the New England Patriots. All right. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right. Battle of Yorktown. Band plays the world turned upside down. Uh, Cornwallis got stuck at Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and so he sends somebody to surrender to Washington. Okay. Treaty of Paris again, 1783. This time, Britain's the big loser. The United States has its independence. It's twice as big. It grows all the way out uh, into the Northwest Territory, all the way out to the Mississippi River. It had only been to the Appalachians. You know, the colonists had only gone to the Appalachians. Um, so doubles in size. Of course, it had double in size again, the Louisiana, Pur Louisiana Purchase. Um... Treat, promise good treatment of loyalists. The British tribe promised to leave those forts in the Northwest Territory. Okay, first government, Articles of Confederation. Articles. I can't, I can't spell it. I can't type it. All right. Okay, sweet government. Um, there's one branch of government, the legislative branch, no executive branch to enforce the laws. No uh, judicial branch to settle disputes. Um, it did a couple of good things. Uh, the land ordinance uh, that sets up the process of creating cities and then especially Northwest Ordinance. It's our first anti-slavery law. No slavery in Northwest Territory. North of the Ohio River. That makes the Ohio River the Jordan River and swing low, sweet chariot. If you can get across the Ohio with... Harriet Tubman can get slaves across the Ohio. You know, they're, they're in free territory. Uh, and let's see, let's see. Uh, man, it's 60,000 people. You become a state. So there's a big deal. So 36 states become states 
using the procedure from the Northwest Ordinance. That's why the what the gold rush is going to be such a big deal, going to be kind of a cause of the Civil War, because all of a sudden you got 80,000 people out there in California. All right, so Northwest Ordinance, you know, so that's a major achievement, but no rest. Uh, the government most uh, most importantly couldn't tax, couldn't regulate trade, different currencies between the states, couldn't enforce laws because no executive branch, couldn't settle disputes, no judicial branch. Uh, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts were having a shooting war, couldn't stop it. Shays' rebellion shows that it's too weak. Daniel Shays and all these Massachusetts war heroes, Western Massachusetts frontier farmers, uh, getting screwed by the East Coast elite. Uh, you know, being overtaxed by the state government, uh, they're getting thrown in debtor's prison, they're losing their land after they've been promised that, you know, social contract, you know, they, they fight for the country, they come back home. Good gracious, one of the tragedies of this year is that we did not have the class where you walked in when we were doing uh, Vietnam and we sang Born in the USA. I don't know why I'm going to do something about that before it's all over with. Uh, maybe today, who knows. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so you're going to have a meeting, big meeting. Uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Convention, 1787, becomes the Constitutional Convention. Madison's the father of the Constitution. Madison says, you know what? Even though we're just here to amend the articles, I got a new plan, whole new plan, the Virginia plans, also the big state plans, got three branches. Small states don't like it, so they got the New Jersey plan. They say, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's just keep the articles. Let's just amend the articles, maybe give the articles a little more power. Uh, you have the Connecticut Compromise, or the Great Compromise creates our bicameral legislature. Remember that. Everybody thinks, everybody at this point in the year, the compromises are all about slavery. But this compromise wasn't about slavery. And that's kind of why it's a great compromise. Is the one compromise that worked out in all these compromises. You got the other two, slave trade and three-fifths. Those are about uh, slavery. All right. Uh, and they're problematic, especially that three-fifths compromise. You know, when you're counting people for the House of Representatives, you'll count three out of every fly, five slaves implies that three, slaves, uh, a slave is three-fifths of a person. All right. Oh, uh, let me see, let me see. Okay, Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So you got the Anti-Federalist concerns. It's six. When I made this before, I could remember all six. Let's see if I can do it again. Getting senile, the later, you know, it's like what is called sundown down disease. Those of us who are senile especially start forgetting things late in the day. So probably it might not happen. All right, so the government's uh, too strong and it's too far away. Remember, remote. People's rights and states' rights won't be respected, and the president's too much like a king, and the electoral college is undemocratic. Boom, baby. All right, not that senile, at least tonight. Uh, so those are the six concerns. So the Federalists are making promises. Hey, we promised George. Well, you know George Washington not going to act like a king. Uh, you can have a Bill of Rights, uh, and then you got these Federalist papers. All right, so let's go with Federalist papers right there. Uh, newspaper articles, get the cool kids on your side. Uh, New York's the cool kids. Virginia, New York. Well, you're going to get Virginia because Washington's from Virginia. So New York. Uh, there's 85 of them to convince New York Anti-Federalists. Most importantly, 10 and 51. 10 is, uh, so I don't know, I'll put maybe 10 and 51. 10, 51. And then let's look and see how much, let's look and see how much room I got right here because we got to get Washington in there. So, hey, we're doing okay. Doing a little better this time. All right, so I'm going to actually put 10. Federalist 10, you got to look out for the factions. Factions, you know, like these groups that just worried about themselves. In high school, we call them cliques. Uh, and what do you do? Well, you can't you spread them out. Bigger is better. Uh, if you spread them out all the creation, no one faction can dominate. Um, you can't take away freedom. That's bad. You can't make everybody just the same. You know, you got the dress problem. We just see things differently. Americans see coronavirus differently. How much of a shutdown should there be? Well, you got these protests going on. You know, people just uh, see things differently. Um, so you can't make everybody just the same, but you can spread them out. Uh, so that's Federal's 10. Federal's 51. All right, next... Next uh, imaginary Jolly Rancher flowing to whoever says, hey, wait a minute, I know. 
If men were angels, no government would be necessary. In other words, you got to have a strong government because we're all kind of screw-ups. All right. If angels were to govern men, neither internal nor external controls would be uh, necessary. So what? You need elections. What, what do you do? You need a strong government. All right. Uh, and you need checks and balances and elections. All right. Strong government, because men are not angels. External controls. That's the elections. Internal controls. That's like the impeachment and the veto. Because guess what? Trump's not an angel. Clinton won an angel. Andrew Johnson won an angel. Nixon won an angel. Uh, you know, the leader's not angels either. All right. Um, so there's the Federalist Papers. Okay. So that gets you to Washington. Now, Washington is best president number two in my book and in a lot of historians' books. So he's setting a lot of precedents. President Washington sets the precedents. Uh, so help me God. He creates the cabinet. Uh, he steps down after eight years. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and talk about the cabinet. You know, you got Jefferson and Madison having it out. Jefferson's at state. Hamilton's at treasury. Hamilton likes that. National Bank, Jefferson says, hey, the Constitution doesn't say. It's not in there. Hamilton says, yeah, but you got the elastic clause. So, you know, you got strict and loose construction. And Hamilton's kind of the, you know, the son that Washington never had. So even though Jefferson, Washington, both Virginia planters, Washington leans Hamilton's away and they keep the bank. And Hamilton's kind of running things. Hamilton's got, oh, that was, dang, I'm on to the next column. All right, I thought I had more room than that. Uh, but let's go with it. So Hamilton's got his economic plan. Um, and it's kind of like the American system of Henry Clay. So he's going to have a tariff. He's going to pay off the debts, right? Uh, if we pay off the debts of the rich folks in other countries, well, we're respected worldwide. Uh, and you got the movers and the shakers rooting for this new government. Uh, but then he's got to have a, he's got to have a whiskey tax which leads to a Whiskey Rebellion and a tariff that's going to kind of help infant industry. So you got the Whiskey Rebellion, and this time, now you got Washington getting in on the act. Uh, and, you know, Washington's showing that the government's strong because uh, he leads 10,000 troops and the farmers just disappear. Frontier Pennsylvania farmers uh, who had been talking about taxation without representation. All right. Uh, anything else, Washington. I think that, you know, that kind of color, I'm trying to think. Seems like there's something I'm missing on him. Uh, precedent, so help me God. All right, fair, farewell address. So we'll put the farewell, you know, I guess that's it. Farewell address. Uh, hey, stay out of permanent alliances. Uh, stay away from political parties. Uh, and so for a long time, we're isolationists right up to, you know, I guess, uh, Spanish-American War, World War One, something like that. Uh, nobody paid any attention to them at all about the parties, and hey, the parties, you know, don't like each other very well. You may these days, you may have noticed. Okay, so then you got Adams. Now, Adams got a tough job. He's got to replace the big man, uh, and so what? His big contribution is keeps us out of war of France. He's a Federalist, and Washington was really a Federalist too. Um, let's see. So they got X Y Z affair. Uh, affair. The Federalists are kind of like the Whigs and the Republicans. So they're the pro-government, pro-business party, urban party, right? And the government is in favor of tariffs that help out businesses back then. Uh, and the kind of northeastern New England kind of party. All right. Whereas the Republicans are the southern and the western farmy, farm party, rural party. Uh, remember when we started on Jefferson, we were uh, trying to come up with, uh, well, we end up playing country roads, I think, at least in one class. Uh, you know, that is, it's the, it's the farmer party, uh, and they don't want government doing anything. All right, they're, they're the strict construction, and the, the Federalists are the loose construction party. All right, but the big deal with Adams once he becomes president is France. So the, you got the hostage crisis, and Adams is a little bit like Jimmy Carter, and like John Quincy Adams, he's a little condescending. Um, and it's a hostage crisis, but he won't negotiate with hostages. You know, they're, they're impressing sailors. 
Um, but so he keeps it out of war of France. That's what he wanted on his tombstone. Uh, here lines John Adams who kept us out of war of France. But he passes the Alien Sedition Acts. Uh, Sedition Act, you can't talk bad about the president. This was unconstitutional. Uh, and Madison and Jefferson are going to pass the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions because Marbury versus Madison hadn't happened yet. Uh, say, and they talk about states' rights. States' rights to nullify unconstitutional laws. So you're going to hear that again with Calhoun, and you're going to hear it again with you know, secession and again with segregation, states rights. You know, we don't have to do what the national government says. Um, anything else to say there? The alien part of it. Well, that's the first. Uh, you got to live here 14 years to become a citizen. He doesn't want French immigrants voting against him. The first of a number of uh, anti-immigrant laws that we looked at this year. All right. What do you think? I say that lasted 22 minutes. Let's see.